Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists and guests here to answer your uh, gardening questions. My name is Candace Hart. I'm a State Master Gardener Specialist for U of I Extension. I'm based here in Central Illinois. And my specialty for answering questions tends to be any of the flower questions, annuals, perennials, cut flowers. That's what I love to talk about, but I have some other great horticulturists and guests here today who are going to answer any of your gardening questions. So you're adding those in the comment box. And our topic, our special topic for the day with our guest speakers is going to be rain gardens. So if you have an interest or question about rain gardens in particular, start putting them in the comment box. But Kelly, you want to introduce yourself to us today? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Alsup, and I am an extension educator in horticulture, and I am based out of Bloomington. My specialty is integrated pest management, and uh, looking at some of the past episodes, I realized that I've never really identified what integrated pest management is, so it's just a varied approach to managing pests, meaning I don't just go and pull out the chemicals and think that's my only strategy to reducing or eliminating pests. So I think about it culturally and physically. And so, uh, and then I have a passion for pollinators and beneficial insects. And then um, on the side, I like to grow some vegetables in containers. Very good. And I'm Ryan Pankow, a horticulture educator out of Champaign. Uh, my area of specialty is probably trees and woody plants, trees and shrubs. Um, you know, secondly, native plants. I love those. And then finally, you know, I'm a vegetable gardener like Kelly. So grow up a big vegetable garden. I like to talk about all that stuff too, but um, we have some special guests today. So. Yeah. Eliana, you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having us. So I'm Eliana Brown. I'm a water quality specialist with Illinois Extension and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant based on campus. And I work on statewide issues. I'm on the Energy Environmental Stewardship and HORT teams and on the University of Land and Water SWAT team. I facilitate the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, which includes stormwater management, and serve as the director of the Red Oak Rain Garden. With Heidi Loosler at Parkman College, I co-teach the National Green Infrastructure Certification Program. I have the honor of supervising these two extraordinary young professionals that I brought with me today. My background is uh, civil and environmental engineering, and I became interested in how permeable landscapes improve water quality in our downstream rivers and lakes and became a certified master gardener. I love talking about rain gardens, uh, and I've been promoting them for the past 15 years. Some of our environmental challenges are so big we feel powerless, and rain gardens are something that many of us can do to make things better. And we can do it in a way that adds beauty and supports pollinators. So today I'll be focusing on homeowner scale, kind of the light engineering aspects of rain gardens. So um, over to you, Lane Kenoki. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm an Extension Outreach Associate uh, with Illinois Extension Ag and Natural Resources uh, and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Uh, I also work on statewide nutrient uh, and stormwater issues. I'm based here in Champaign on the University of Illinois campus. Uh, I'm on the horticulture team with Extension, uh, and my background uh, is in landscape architecture. Uh, I'm a master gardener and also the landscape designer of the Red Oak Rain Garden. I love native plants, uh, and in fact, I have uh, I've built a prairie and, uh, and uh, a bunch of example gardens uh, in my parents' backyard, so I have to give mom and dad a shout out. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to be happy. Or I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have today about rain garden plants uh, and or uh, just general plant selection. Uh, and I'll send it over to Kate. All right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kate. I'm also an Extension Outreach Associate with um, Illinois Extension Ag and Natural Resources, and based on campus, working on statewide issues. My main focus is on the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, and my background is in sustainability and communications. I serve on the Energy and Environmental Stewardship Team and IC's new Engagement SWAT Team. 
even though I'm appearing on live with the horticulturalists, I do not know very much about plants. <laughs> but I'm passionate about sustainability and promoting sound ecological practices. So that's something. And um, I serve as the communications manager for the Red Oak Rain Garden, which is a demonstration site on campus um, that I'm gonna talk about today. Awesome, okay. Well, welcome guys. We're so happy to have you here today. So everybody watching, if you have um, questions about rain gardens or anything garden related today, uh, feel free to start adding those into the comment box and we'll address those as we go through. But you might also be wondering, well, what the heck is a rain garden? So we're definitely going to address that to start with. And they have some great content they're going to talk about today. So I will pass it back to our guests to get started. Thanks. And Lane, if you can start this slideshow aspect of it and take it to the first slide, we can talk about what a rain garden actually is. So uh, a rain garden is a shallow basin. It's used to capture that stormwater runoff. So that's that water that is going into that middle basin there. It has plants and it also has layers of uh, different mulches, soils, and aggregates that's used to mimic the ecological functions of a natural landscape. So uh, rain gardens are really great because they, they capture, filter, treat, and infiltrate or transpire stormwater, which helps us with mitigating flooding and it also improves water quality. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, that definitely helps. I know I put at my first house a couple years ago, I know I put in a very small kind of rain garden to start with after, after learning about what those were. So I'm excited to hear more about kind of the, the basics of it again, because I haven't put one in yet at my new house. So I definitely would like to. Okay. okay. I don't see any questions yet. So let's go ahead and keep talking about some more rain garden information. Yes, like I, I think my first question is, how do I know if I have what it takes to start a rain garden in my, my, on my, in my yard? Excellent question. Oh, that is a great question. Actually, um, I think that that's a, a good segue. Lane, if you wouldn't mind to go to the slides that talks about how to get started. That is the number one question that people ask me is, what do I do? How do I start? What do I, how do I, how do I know? Yeah. So I'm gonna and give you- Does a every garden have what it takes to have a rain garden? Yeah, that is a great, great question. Um, the, the first thing that um, is, evaluating your house and property. So we're kind of, you know, we're talking homeowner scale rain gardens. So uh, uh, what I've shown here is just a typical house there on the left. So the first thing that a person should do in figuring out if their place is a good place for it is figuring out where their downspouts are. So if you if you click that, thank you. you in this particular photo in the left, you see the downspouts there on the left. Uh, and then, um, if you go to say like Google Earth, find your house, it's nice you can just do a screen capture and then identify where those downspouts are on that, uh, that, that screen capture. So there's the three that are analogous to the house on the left. Um, on this particular house, there are two more. Uh, and so some things to, to think about with this whole property that I'm seeing here, that, that lets me know where my water source is gonna come from, because as we've said, we need to have, or that stormwater is coming from the roof and going into the rain garden. So it's going there via these downspouts. So that gives you some options of where that rain garden might be. And in this particular house, uh, you can see some places that just really wouldn't work like that, um, that the, the second downspout from the left, there's just kind of this tiny little area and it's sort of bound in from the sidewalk. Uh, and there's a lot of roof that would contribute to that. So that's probably not a very good place for one. Uh, some, folks, uh, some folks may not want to have a rain garden in their front yard. Uh, I think a rain garden in the front yard is a great idea, but other folks may not want to have that. So, um, the thing that's kind of 
nice in this particular example is that they have this really great big expanse of a backyard, which might be a good place to, to put that. And so in this particular example, uh, if you do the next click, that then shows that is the whole expanse of roof that would be contributing to that rain garden via that downspout. Um, I can go into how we size things, but I think the question that you really are asking is then, um, or the, the next part or what would come next, the next question that you should ask is, is my, um, is my soil um, able to support a rain garden? And with that, I'll actually um, send you to a, a link that is, uh, I have a short URL for water to soak into the water, or excuse me, to soak into the ground, because that's what we really need to find out. We have a lot of clay soils around here in Champaign-Urbana where, where I live. Um, I don't know what the soils are like in Bloomington, Kelly, but um, they... They're, they're like yours. They're like ours. Okay. So some places they have, there's a lot of clay. Some places there's not. Um, and even in, even in our areas, and, and it can really depend on a lot of different things. Uh, I know in the Peoria area, their, their soils are a lot sandier. So I think that infiltration would probably go pretty quickly. Uh, I've done the infiltration test in my own backyard, and I was actually really surprised at how quickly the water soaked into the ground. So even in an area that you may think has clay soils, it, it still may work for rain garden. But you want to have it soak, the water to soak into the ground uh, within 24 hours so that you aren't holding water and encouraging mosquitoes because we have enough of them already. Um, I, I have plenty in my, in, uh, in, in my property here in August, so we don't want to be able, we don't want to create more mosquitoes and create a situation where we have that. So we really have to make sure that the water is going to infiltrate into the ground so you're not supporting that. Awesome. And we did have a question come through from Mary kind of along these lines. She says, uh, runoff from my roof goes into a long gully that eventually ends up in my lake. Could this be a rain garden area? And she said, also, my gully area is not wet all the time. Does that sound like it would be a potential rain garden option? I think so. I mean, I think it could be. Yeah. Um, I, the more, if we want to get real technical about it, that would be what we call a bioswale because there's some direction to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, 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 the thing that we would be wanting to create with that uh, is adding some plants so to encourage that infiltration into the ground. Um, the, it, I, I would want to ask a follow-up question to Mary to find out um, how quickly the, the water um, travels from her place to the lakes is uh, with, um, there are some times with a, a bioswale, if it's traveling too quickly, there's not enough time for the water to infiltrate into the ground. So you're not getting that kind of action that you want. Uh, and there's there's a few little speed bumps that can be put in, even sometimes with a, uh, um, decorative rocks, larger rocks. That's one way of doing it. But yeah, I, I think that there's a, um, that there's a possibility that uh, the existing gully could be a nice bioswell. Awesome. Okay. And then the Kathy also has a potential area. She says um, she has easements on her property. It stays wet most of the spring harbors mosquitoes during summer. Can I convert this area into a rain garden, do you think? That's a great question. And I think that that's where I would encourage that percolation test. Because um, if it's staying wet, that sometimes can be the, the indication that you have clay soils. Mm -hmm. And you may want to use some other kind of technique, say like a French drain to direct the, the water away from there. Um, you. You, if you are um, really getting into this, uh, you could, there, 
You could change out some of the soil and use an engineered soil. That's generally beyond the scope of what a, a homeowner might want to do, but um, I would really, really encourage that infiltration test. Awesome. So Eliana, the infiltration test is going to tell me how fast the water drains. Now, do I want it to drain fast or do I want it to drain slower? I mean, because we think about rain gardens and we're thinking about now, mm -hmm. it's we're in the middle of a kind of a droughty situation. So mm -hmm. technically, does a rain garden have to stay wet the entire season? Or is a rain garden just something, a, a, a garden to use to capture that storm water? That's a great question. And it's the second one. So a, a rain garden is not a water garden. A water garden stays wet all the time, maybe has goldfish in it. A rain garden is designed to drain down and be wet when it rains and then dry as soon as possible. So the answer to your question of do you want that infiltration test to go quickly, uh, the answer is, is yes, it's certainly within the 24 hour period. Yeah. I did wanna maybe like um, come back around to that area that has uh, a lot of water that, that the person put that question on. Um, this is a little different situation, but in my own house, I where my air conditioner condensate comes out, of course it's wet a lot of times. So I've put particular plants that like to be wet in that location. So I wanted, I wondered, um, Lane, if you would be willing to talk about some plants that might do really well in an area that has wet feet. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, let me uh, let me pull up some uh, some slides of that. And while you're doing that, Lane, Mary said it's a, a fairly small grade from her house to that lake, so I don't think it would move super fast. So oh. it's like, like that might be a good option then. Yeah, yeah, that could work really well. Yeah. If you do it, send photos. I want to see it. So uh, with with plants in mind, um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell you all about uh, uh, the the general um, plants that uh, can go into these rain gardens because you know we have different we have varying levels of of moisture in uh, in these rain gardens right because we have you know some places uh, of the garden that you know are higher up. Uh, and, and therefore have less water that collects. And then of course we have places down low where you know, we have all kinds of water. So uh, as Eliana said, you know, the, that lowest area of the, of the rain garden is, is where the water pools, it soaks into the ground. Um, so uh, if we explore you know, what that entails for our, our plant selections, right? Um, we have we can think about you know it in three separate sections. We've got banks, we've got slopes, and we've got the basin. So our banks are are the sort of high and dry location in the rain garden. The slope is that in between. You know it it needs to be able to the plants that go there need to be able to uh, you know uh, exist in a moderate moisture uh, soil moisture kind of level. And then of course the basin where, you know, we could have inundation there uh, six inches for, you know, 18 hours or so. Our plants need to be able to, to survive that. And luckily we have all kinds of plants that are adapted to all of those locations. So if we look at the banks, um, of course, where, where the drier plants need to be, um, there's there's just, there's so many. And it's, it's kind of difficult being a, uh, a native plant crazy person, uh, you know, giving a, a quick presentation like this to narrow it down, uh, you know, just to talk about a few species of plants. But I want to tell you about uh, uh, ground covers and sort of their importance. Um, there's there's so much that you can do with these. Uh, some can be really simple, monochromatic. Some can be really showy, like uh, purple poppy mallow that you see on the right side of your screen. 
Um, the ground covers, they, they help shade out weeds, which in turn lessens our maintenance uh, needs over time, which uh, of course everyone can get behind. Uh, prairie drop seed on the left side is, is sort of our go-to versatile native grass. It's great for the conditions that you have, you know, on those, on those banks. And uh, Kate actually brought this up yesterday, and I, I really like the analogy. You can almost think of those ground covers as being the cookie, and then you have uh, cookies are always better with chocolate chips, in my opinion, and the, the flowers are sort of the chocolate chips in this situation. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I, that's, that's fun. I, I, I enjoy that. It's a good way to, to you know, shorten of what could be a very long talk. Uh, why we have Kate on the team. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, you know, a, a plant that most people know, black-eyed Susans, they're just, they're such a versatile plant. It pairs really nicely with black-eyed Susan. And with this cookie or the, the chocolate chip layer, the flowers, you can really start to play with seasonality on these, um, you know, black-eyed Susans, great example. Uh, summer into fall bloomer, keeps the black eye uh, uh, seed heads well into the winter months, which can be really beautiful in, in frosts and snows. Uh, you get to play with all of the colors and, and different seasons of blooms. And that, that, of course, that doesn't just apply to the banks um, of, of these rain gardens. It, it, it spans the whole garden. So moving down into the slopes, that next level down where uh, the plants need to be more adapted to moderate soil moisture levels. Uh, some ground covers that you can use there, Pennsylvania sedge, prairie alum root, both Illinois natives, both really great uh, garden plants. Um, as a landscape designer, I really enjoy uh, playing with unique textures. So, you know, that grassy texture of Pennsylvania sedge um, paired with the, the uh, you know, sort of more robust broadleaf texture of that prairie alum root. If you put those in groups of five or 10 and make a sort of mass planting of those, you know, in any situation, rain garden or not, it's going to be beautiful, especially if you add the, the chocolate chips on top of that. Uh, the, the flowers for this, for this level, some of my favorite uh, Prairie Blazing Star, uh, another uh, plant that a lot of, of us native plant uh, crazy people are, are pretty familiar with. Uh, I personally enjoy uh, the cultivar Kobold uh, in, my, in my personal gardens. Um, and then if you add in some spring blooming columbine and, and uh, great blue lobelia and cone flowers, you know, in your later season blooms, you get to cover, you know, all four seasons of, of uh, interest. And then finally, the basin, right? This is this is where a lot of people have questions as to what they can plant because there's not a ton of plants that can uh, or that enjoy being uh, surrounded and, and inundated by water for you know a, a relatively long period of time, but they exist. And Illinois has some great ones. For ground covers here, uh, some of our favorites are Emery Sedge and Common Rush. Common rush in particular is, is a really uh, fantastic plant. It gets this really dark green foliage uh, that really kind of stands out in the garden. And it'll actually keep that color uh, into the winter months. Um, it's a semi evergreen plant, kind of keeps some structure in the garden. It's really beautiful. And then the flowers, you get some really, really unique showy flowers in these wetter areas of the, of the rain garden. Southern blue flag iris, got a beautiful flower and its foliage is actually really quite nice as well. Um, Swamp milkweed on the right side uh, it has that great flower and uh, it's it's got that additional um, benefit of being uh, a monarch uh, post plant. And then the Joe pie weed, it's, a, it's sort of a staple rain garden plant. Uh, I, I would uh, give you fair warning that these straight species will get quite tall. I have some in my gardens at home that's eight feet, and it also likes to readily uh, reseed itself in other places in the garden. That's not to say it's a bad plant, um, but I typically would recommend going with a cultivar that stays a little bit more under control, like uh, Little Joe here. It's 
the great uh, cultivar. Um, so that sort of gives you just a really quick, brief, uh, very brief introduction to some rain garden plants, you know, on the, the limited time that we have to talk. But uh, yeah, if, if there are any questions, I'd be, I'd be glad to, to talk. Awesome. That was super helpful. Really good plants. Lane, um, where would cardinal flower do best? So cardinal flower is, it's an interesting plant. Typically in uh, its native setting, it would be found on like a woodland border. Uh, it likes uh, quite a bit of moisture. Um, so I usually would use that in uh, the bottom of, uh, of a shady rain garden. I will also add that in my prairie that I talked about at the beginning of this, of this conversation, um, I have a decent amount of cardinal flower and it is in full sun and it does bloom and it does well. Uh, it just stays a little bit shorter and doesn't seem to, uh, the leaves tend to burn a little bit more in the sun. Um, but yeah, it's cardinal flower is a fantastic plant. That red folia, uh, the red flowers on that are, are stunning. Yeah. Cool. Okay. We've had a couple of plant questions come in and then we'll go back to a couple more kind of rain garden location questions. Um, Mary asks, can you use the pink, uh, chilo, is it chilone? Did I say that right? Chilone, chilone? Uh, is it a, a turtle head? Chilone? Yes, turtle head, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's another species um, that's, that's great for rain gardens. Uh, at the Red Oak Rain Garden, we have um, the white uh, turtle head, and, and the, the botanical name is, is slipping my mind, but um, yeah, we, we have that growing, uh, in full sun, uh, in the, the bottom of, of the rain garden. It's doing very well. Uh, we've got a great show of, of white flowers coming from that. I think that the, the pink is probably, um, you know, in the same sort of, it likes to have wet feet. It likes to have full sun. Mm -hmm. Similar conditions, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. You don't have to know scientific names on this show. Nobody, nobody knows. <laughs> You're good. If if it's in the Red Oak Rain Garden, I've I've looked at the names so many times at this point. I know most of them, but that one is slipping my mind. <laughs> it's clay, it's the Clayoni. Of course, I, I can't pronounce it either. The Clayoni oblica. Am I right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Aaron asks, so are the plants for the basin? Good ones to plant in the areas where the condensation from the water comes down and hangs out. Yeah, yeah. And Eliana, I think that you've actually, uh, you've used some of the same species that we've used at the rain garden right yeah. underneath your, your line. I do. I have the juncus and the iris. And uh, the iris, I think the iris is winning. It is perhaps winning a little too much. It's not... It's, uh, <laughs> really doing well um, but I also have the junkus there and and uh, I, I I agree with you it's such it's such a, a wonderful plant that I wouldn't have really known about without um, having the red oak rain garden I I definitely did not choose this virtual background to show off that exact combination but <laughs> so the the plant with the, the little um, brown dots. That's that is the juncus that she's talking about. Common rush is is its common name, and then the the more broad leaf. Uh, that's that's the foliage of uh, southern blue flag iris. So it makes for a really nice combination. Yeah, you totally planned that. Yeah, isn't it ironic how we as gardeners we want our plants to do well, Eliana, but if they do too well. <laughs> <laughs> then we're like, oh no. Oh, uh -uh. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I I think we are, <laughs> that's so funny. I think, in, like in, in many things, we strive for balance. And I was hoping for a little more of that balanced combination like Lane has in his background. But yeah, the iris is, is the clear champion. And <laughs> Yeah, I, I can say that with, with my Joe Pie weed as well, which, <laughs> no joke, I put it in last year and it is eight feet tall this year. Uh, wow. And I made the mistake of putting some Jacob's ladder underneath it. So I had to go back and cut uh -huh. cut the Joe Pie weed basically to the ground so that I can remove it and move it to a different location because I can't let the Jacob's ladder uh, 
die. Can't do it. So Lane, would you suggest uh, another combination of plants for Eliana to maybe put the iris back in its place, like a, something more aggressive than the juncus? Give me a competitor. Yeah. 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 It would be, it'd be interesting because, you know, that, that Southern blue flag iris um, in, in its right conditions, the, the leaves, the blades on that uh, plant can get quite tall. And Eliana, I don't know how tall they are for you, but to bring in a competing plant for that, you would need something that's almost taller than that. You know, you need something to kind of control it and, and keep it in its place. So, you know, if, if worse, so, you know, if, if the worst comes to fruition, uh, it, it might actually be smart to either, um, you know, divide out that iris or just remove it entirely and replace mm -hmm. it with a species that maybe doesn't get so uh, so tall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's what I was going to suggest. Just in the spring, maybe come in and divide out a good portion of it to kind of keep it as a smaller clump, keep it a little bit in check. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. I did make a tiny little almost uh, fairy garden swale under my air conditioner condensate that has tiny little rocks like you would have in it, like a large swale. Um, but the iris is shaded that out. So <laughs> I might need to divide that out. The fairies need the shade right now, Eliana. <laughs> but they're getting water. It's hot out there. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, they, so the, the iris and the fairies are doing really well in my <laughs> little lot. That sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, Lane, we've had one other plant question here. Denise sure. asks, which of those plants will work in a shaded area? You want to touch on some shade options? Sure. Yeah. So uh, the the common rush and the the southern blue flag iris would surprise you. Um, they do very well in full sun, but they will also work uh, in at least part shade, uh, if not you know three quarter shade conditions. We have it at the rain garden, the red oak rain garden, growing in some full shade conditions, and they're doing very well. Um, definitely cardinal flower is, is a species that I would recommend um, for, for uh, you know, your shady uh, rain gardens. Another plant that, uh, that we really like um, is uh, celandine poppy. Uh, that's that's uh, a species, again, that we have at the Red Oak Rain Garden. Uh, it's mostly shade, actually, uh, there, there at the garden, probably two-thirds two shade. So we had to really um, explore some options for plants that will do well in uh, in a shaded rain garden. Celandine poppy, uh, it comes on with an early yellow bloom. Um, and sometimes it's considered um, a spring ephemeral. So every once in a while, the leaves might not make it through the whole season. I've got it growing in my personal gardens and the foliage still today um, you know, towards the end of August, still looks really good. Um, so that's that's another species I would I would recommend. Joe pieweed um, can do well in shade as well. Good. Where yeah, would you put the celadine that. poppy? Would you put that on the bank, the slope, or the basin? So the the banks and the slopes are are where that will do best. It will not do well in the basin, um, but uh, it it can perform nicely. Uh, you know, in, in the sort of more moderate moisture, dry um, soils. Thank you. So if, if folks are wondering if they have a bank or a slope or a basin, I assume there's probably a rain garden setting where you might not have one of those. You might just have the water spot and like the slope, or could you guys address that? I know I've got that question before. Hmm. Interesting. Um, <laughs> You know, classic rain garden is going to have that shape, and you want that shape. Uh, kind of going back to a question that Kelly had, because that's where you, how you're really going to capture that water. Um, I say that, and I have um, I have a like a I call it a no dig rain garden in my own backyard, where lots of downspouts go to, and I don't really necessarily have that, but a classic rain garden really would. Uh, so they, they, the whole idea for the, the bank, the slope, and the basin is for you to do, a, it gives you a clue on um, the moisture level for the 
plants that are going to do best there. So in my no dig rain garden, um, I actually do have a little bit of juncus over there too, right where the downspout comes out. But um, it, I, 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 I didn't have to necessarily be as careful with that. Um, the juncus is doing well there, but I, I would be, I would be a little cautious to put too many plants in that kind of rain garden that would want to ha be have wet feet for a longer period of time. I don't know. They also need to withstand dry, so that might it might be okay too. Um, the great thing about native plants is they are very forgiving in a lot of ways, uh, and um, they they do at least in my own personal garden seem to um, let me know by either not doing well and not coming back or jumping to a different place uh, so that they're in a place that works best for them. Um, Lane, would you uh, build on that? Any Anything else you'd wanna say? Yeah, I mean, uh, so Ryan, if, if you have, um, you know, a sort of rain garden, that maybe does not have a bank. Maybe it's just in the rain garden is in an area or the garden in general is in an area where your moisture levels are, are more moderate. Then I, you know, I'd say you just simply leave out the, the dry loving plants and just skip directly to, um, you know, the, the plants more suited to that moderate um, soil moisture levels. Uh, uh, like Eliana was saying, uh, our native species, there's so, there's a lot that are very tolerant. Um, Black-eyed Susan, one of the examples that I gave to you um, as a bank plant can also work on the slope and some some publications even have it in the basin. I wouldn't go as far to say that Black-eyed Susan should be in the basin of a rain garden, but that just kind of goes to show that um, we, we have a lot of plant species that can work in multiple locations. Um, you know, that, that doesn't mean you put cardinal flower, you know, on the driest location you can find and hope that it survives because it probably, it, it, it won't thrive at, at the very least. Um, but that's, that's what I would add. Yeah. Awesome. So it's like, you know, a rain garden is not a one size fits all. It's a, you need to interpret your area and the water permeability and then make the decisions on what plant materials would do well there. Exactly. Yeah. One of the things that's kind of nice about the Red Oak Rain Garden that um, we developed on campus is that it has a lot of different conditions and biomes. It's 10,000 square feet. So it has a lot of these different conditions. Um, I don't know uh, if it would be, um, a good time for maybe Kate to talk a little bit more about that project and show some pictures and how people can learn more about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got a couple questions then that we can address um, after that then, yeah. Oh, okay. Go okay. Um, I will uh, pull up the slides for you, Kate. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, so uh, like we mentioned earlier, the uh, Red Oak Rain Garden is our project on campus. It's located between Allen Hall and McKinley Health Center, and we just renovated it last fall. Um, if you wanna go to the next one. So this view is on the south side of the garden looking north. This is where the water comes in by the rock on the lower left side of the uh, screen and it infiltrates in this basin here, in this sunny portion. We also have these other two basins, oh, go back. <laughs> um, across the sidewalk, you can see under the trees. Um, and that's kind of what they were talking about when they say there are a lot of different biomes because you have this sunny portion and also that portion that's very much dominated by those two trees and is very shady. Uh, there's an overflow into that parking lot. You can kind of see the cars um, in the back of the picture. Um, and you can see our rain gauge on the right side too. Uh, come visit us. Lots of flowers are still in bloom and it looks really great. Next one. 
So um, this is what it is not what it looks like right now. This is last fall when we right after we had planted it. Um, the bridge abutments, you can see it's there should looks like there should be something there, and that's because there should be and there will be soon. Um, hopefully we're gonna put in this bridge and this is a rendering of what the garden will look like at maturity in a couple of years when the plants really have a chance to establish themselves. And um, so hopefully it'll look just like this when the bridge is built and everyone will be really happy and just fawning over the garden and everyone's gonna love it. <laughs> And I run our social media accounts. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now TikTok. We just got an account on TikTok, very excited. <laughs> we also have a, an active blog on our website to check out. Our website's redoakraingarden.org. And you can always email us at redoakraingarden at gmail.com as well. If you're interested in collaborating, um, whether that's writing a blog or doing a spotlight series on our social media pages, just shoot us an email. We're always looking for partners and volunteers. All right, that's all from me. Have you I have a question for you, Kate. How do you measure that this red oak rain garden is doing what you want it to do? Well, um, I guess we would measure that by um, using the rain gauge, seeing how much rain we get over um, a rain event. And then you kind of just glance in the garden at the basin and see, did it infiltrate the water? Is it still sitting there? Is there water on the sidewalk that it didn't get? Um, before we renovated it there and before it was built um, in the first place, there would be water and mud on the sidewalks. And, um, you know, it's kind of inconvenient and uh, the sidewalks get nasty with dirt and debris. And um, actually we spoke to someone um, who's in a chair, uh, Paralympian Susanna Scaroni. We talked to her about um, like what this project, like how it would affect someone in a chair and turns out we didn't even think of this. Um, when they go through that area, their hands get wet and oh. like gross because they got to touch the wheels and it's spinning it's up gross water at them. And so that was something we hadn't even considered, but you know, we're so glad that that is helping um, because no one wants to get their hands wet on a, you know, with gross water. So um, if Eliana or Elaine have anything to add, they're really the experts on this. Um, so before the think? garden, you had flooding. Now you're not having as much flooding in that area. Right. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks yeah. are dry, like Kate said. Yeah, and, and, and also, just go ahead, Eliana. Well, I was just going to mention that we have partnered with a professor in civil and environmental engineering to install some monitoring. He's still in the process of installing it but it will let us know some of the moisture levels. We can have a little uh, greater specificity as to what's going on beneath the soil. Um, and like Kate said, we, we, we um, take a look when it's raining and make sure that it's infiltrated in, uh, in a short amount of time. Kate also mentioned that overflow, that's for when we have those uh, torrential rains. And so we wanted yeah. to make sure that there is a, a way for if we have days upon days upon days of back-to-back -back rain, which we get sometimes that there's some way for the, the water to safely go into the storm sewer. Uh, but as it's been, especially right now, as Lane knows, because he's been watering the garden, how dry it's been, we haven't had that issue. Uh, but when we have had our rain, uh, it really infiltrates very quickly. So Lane, yeah. you had some things to add. Just just to give an example, um, you know, of, of how we how we can measure the success of the rain garden. Um, if you remember back to like it was either late May or early June, I think it was the last time that it rained in Champaign. Um, we got like three inches. I was I was kidding, but it's it's been a while. Uh, we we got something like three three and a half inches of rain um, in in a single storm event. 
so that was a very heavy rain that we had. And uh, we went out to the garden the following day. Uh, we checked our rain gauges, which at the time we didn't have that big one installed. Our rain gauge was actually overtopped. So we had to, to use uh, data from, from the stations elsewhere in town. And with all of that rain that we got in such a short period of time, at the very bottom of the rain garden, there was maybe four inches of standing water. Um, and that water was gone uh, in less than 24 hours, which is very impressive um, you know, for how much rain we got, how quickly it came down, uh, and, how, and then just how fast it absorbed um, back into the ground. Yeah, and I mean, the, the rain garden captures water from, from nearly an acre um, of, of campus. So that's a lot of water that is flowing into the garden. Um, yeah, we're, we're very, we, we're continually impressed by it. Great, that's really good. Okay, I'm gonna scroll back up here and come back to some questions. We've got about 15 minutes left. So if anybody has questions still, add them to the comments. Um, Donna asked earlier, when kind of when we were talking about um, checking the soil and stuff, she asked, how and where do I get a soil test? She lives in Whiteside County, and she says she has very sandy ground and has planted a number of trees, and they've all died over the years. So, Donna, I would give your local extension office a call, um, call the Whiteside County Extension Office. We typically have soil tests available in the offices that you can then send a sample off to a lab and get some of that information back for you. So, And U of I Extension has um, a, a list of soil testing labs also, yes. if you Google it. Yeah, we do have a website. Yeah, if you just Google Illinois Soil Testing Labs, I bet it'll, it'll pop up. Yep, so if you're not able to um, get a hold of Extension Office or make it to the office, you can check that list too as well. Because, you know, we're not handing out soil tests right now, Candace. True, true. Very true. <laughs> Very true. That's my second call to ask. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, Angela, uh, question earlier. I'm wondering if you can put a rain garden in the corner of my yard, even though the water gathers like a small lake in the middle of my yard. Is there a way to draw the water to the back end instead? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Well, without being in the yard, but from the description, there's a couple of ways of transferring the, the water from where it's pooling to the place where you want to have the rain garden. And actually, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good way of doing it. If you have an area that maybe the soil isn't conducive, if there's a way of getting that water to another part of your yard where the soil would work better than... than that's a good plan. So a French drain can work, an overland flow with kind of like the, the bioswale kind of gullyish kind of uh, idea is another way of, of doing it. Um, and that might be the easiest way, depending on how else you want to work on the property. Uh, but yes, the answer is yes. Awesome. Very good. Um, okay, and then I think we had another plant question come in. Mary also asked, any shrub ideas for the banks? For the banks, uh, yes. Yeah. So um, hmm, there are a lot of really good ones. Uh, I'm just going choose? to, what's that? But how are you going to choose? <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, again, make sure that you're paying attention to uh, the sun conditions. Um, uh, for sun bank shrubs, um, one of my favorites that I'm really pushing for right now is uh, red chokeberry. Um, it's just, it is a beautiful, beautiful plant. Aronia in general, um, that whole family of, of shrubs, um, just, just outstanding plants. They perform very, very well, great fall color. Um, beautiful red berries um, that are uh, eaten by birds uh, as we get into the winter months. Um, yeah, and then maybe uh, uh, New Jersey tea is is a good one as well. It's a little bit of a smaller shrub. Um, if that's something that you're you're looking for, um, yeah. And then if you look at at shade conditions, you can have. Um, uh, winterberry is a great one. 
Uh, spice bush is another native. These are all natives that I'm telling you about because you know I'm the native plant crazy person. But um, you know there there are other uh, species that will work well uh, too. Red twig dogwood um, does really well, uh, especially in a slope or basin condition. It doesn't quite like the dry as much. It'll tolerate it, but those red twigs in the winter months are are fantastic. Should we put a plug in if they're in the Champaign Urbana region, Ryan, for your sale? Oh, yeah, for for anybody in the Champaign Urbana region, uh, the East Central Illinois Master Naturalists have a tree and shrub sale that's open right now and. Uh, how it works is it's an online sale where you would order now and pick up the plants in October um, at the perfect time for planting for a fall planting. And I know we have chokeberry on the list. I'm trying to think of some of the others. Um, you know, one of the plants I, was, I would ask you about, Lane, is where would you put a button bush? And it's a little bit larger of a shrub, so it needs mm -hmm. space. But one of my favorites. Uh, so where where would you cite the button bush in your ring? Yeah, so that's button bush is another one of those slope or basin plants. It, it likes moisture. Um, it can get quite big, uh, and that's that's another situation where I typically you know say if you don't have the space for it, either don't do it or get a cultivar, right? Because you don't want to have a twelve foot tall button bush growing in a garden that is fifty square feet. It just won't work. Um, but they, they typically like, uh, you know, sort of that woodland edge, part sun to shade, um, sun conditions can do really well in full sun as well. I mentioned that natives can, they, they can handle a lot of varying conditions. Button bush is another example of that. Um, but in, at the Red Oak Rain Garden, we have it growing uh, on the slopes in an area that is part, partly shaded. Yeah, just a, a tough, tough plant. And and like you said, there are a number of different cultivars out there that are sh shorter in size and still have the awesome flowers. And I mean, yeah. I've just been amazed at the uh, pollinator visitation on that plant. Oh yeah, it's it's outstanding. Yeah. 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 And it's it's flower. Uh, it, it's got an interesting shaped flower that um, resembles uh, a virus. Um, so it's, it's kind of become popular in, in memes lately. So just, it's, it's a neat plant for sure. And it is great with pollinators as well. I knew Ryan was going to ask about that plant. Loves them. <laughs> Love with it. Yes. We're, we're it's glad a good one. He is yeah, in love with button bush. Ryan. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> and, and, you know, my, my other favorite you already mentioned was spice yeah. bush. I love that for a shady spot. I mean, yeah. that's just a great one. So. And it's fully spice bush is leaves uh, in the fall, that bright, bright yellow in a full shade location. It's a really outstanding plant. Plus, it's always fun to watch for the caterpillars of the spice bush butterfly, uh, spice bush swallowtail, I believe it is. Um, really cool caterpillar uh, that I've been looking for. We have six, I think we have six spice bush at the Red Oak Rain Garden. I have not seen a caterpillar yet, but I, I've been keeping my eye peeled. Nice. Yeah, we need to get Ryan some button bush t shirts or something. Yeah, <laughs> button bush and spice bush. <laughs> uh, Mary asks, what is the name or website to order those, those uh, plants and shrubs? So we'll try to get that in the the sure. comment box to get a link for that. Um, and then, so keep those questions coming. we got about five minutes left. Um, on another note, Sharon asks, so here's a veggie question uh, for Kelly and Ryan. How do I eliminate asparagus roots? The raised bed was planted by the previous homeowners and this year's harvest did not do well. Wanted to get rid of asparagus. What would you do? Um, well, I guess it depends on what you want there after the asparagus. I mean, one way to get rid of it would be to mow it. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I'm just relaying that from uh, times where I've seen wild asparagus growing, and that's been a way that I've seen it inadvertently eliminated. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it definitely has a lot of roots. You know, asparagus has a, a lot of roots to it. So um, you're going to have to dig up or get rid of those roots. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, Kelly, What would, would you have a suggestion for how to get rid of it? I guess I've always tried to keep it. So <laughs> I, really tried to keep I, it I know, I kind of want her to maybe reconsider her idea because 
uh, you know, perennial vegetables, I mean, they are just like stars. When you can get a vegetable that comes back year after year, um, it, it, it can help. It, it, it's awesome. And then you can like maybe look up some care instructions on asparagus, which is not horrible. But yes, I do think cutting it back um, might deplete the root system a little bit. But digging it out, replacing the soil, that's what I would do. Yep, that's what I was thinking. But, but think about, you know, if you're willing to go for asparagus, think about um, keeping it um, or um, maybe you know, the big, planting it somewhere big. else where it's not in an area you want to intensely garden. Yeah, the big challenge with asparagus is just the weeding. I mean, it's like a, any other perennial bed where you've got a, I mean, it's a year-round weeding project. And I know, I mean, mine looks terrible right now. It's something I've been meaning to get out to all week this week. Uh, and it's just, it's so, so that's probably the biggest issue with asparagus. But man, as far as like pounds of veggies per acre that you could get from a plant, um, there's a ton of asparagus you'd harvest out of that patch. So definitely worth considering if you like asparagus. There you go. Where are your options, Mary? And then let's, I think this will be our last question of the day. Uh, what would be a recommendation for a native shady ground cover to grow between tree roots? Uh, uh, yeah, so Eliana, I get to plug my favorite I know, combination. I I'm excited for you. <laughs> so my, my favorite combination of, of plants exactly for those situations, and I can attest because it's at the Red Oak Rain Garden, underneath the Red Oak, growing in between the roots, um, Pennsylvania Sedge and uh, Jacob's Ladder. Okay. Yeah, that, that is my new go-to suggestion for uh, shade plantings. Oh. Uh, underneath the trees. Yeah. Oh, and there it is. Kate, Kate just changed her virtual background to that. And remember that that was just put in in the fall. So they were still very small. And that picture was taken this spring. Um, but the Jacob's Ladder gets that, that beautiful blue flower on it. And on after it's done blooming, it keeps the most amazing um, foliage uh, through through the year um, or through through the growing season. It'll, it'll die back in the winter time. But that Pennsylvania sedge mixed with Jacob's ladder uh, is is a great great combination for those conditions. The other day when you were talking about it, you even described the Jacob's ladder leaves as almost being fern like. Which yeah, yeah. they're almost they're almost fern like. They're very very unique. Um, there's not very many plants that 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 look like Jacob's ladder. Um, and if you're not familiar, I would I would definitely recommend uh, looking up that those those two plants. Yeah, I love, I have a couple of Jacob's Ladders. Um, there's a variegated one that I love. I think the cultivar is Stairway to Heaven. Yep. And oh, to kind of how the, the leaves are arranged going up. It's a great. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a beautiful plant. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, I think we made it through all of our questions today. So any final thoughts about rain gardens before we sign off today, guys? They're really fun. <laughs> and they're very useful um, for 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 us, you know, as aesthetically and for pollinators and and for water quality. They're they're great, you know, a great kind of uh, project for for a person to work on or a family or a community or a campus. So we're really uh, excited. We're really excited for the interest in rain gardens, and um, we can. Um, just urge you to visit the website of the Red Oak Rain Garden. There will be some, maybe some links to some um, brochures that uh, Lane and the team have put together. Oh, Kate, if you want to put an extra plug in for the handle of the social media handle. Yes. Um, across all of our platforms, we're Rain Garden UIUC. Real simple. Follow us on everything. <laughs> including TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious here. I know. Are you going to be like dancing in the rain garden? We'll have to I, see. I don't know. Probably. Probably. Give the people what they want. Yeah. yeah I mean, totally. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you everybody for asking great questions today. I hope you learned a lot about rain gardens and just gardening in general. So we will see you next time with the new topic and a 
new group of questions. So have a great rest of the day, everybody. Happy gardening and uh, enjoy the heat that we have at the, at the moment. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see Thank you next you, time. Thank, yep. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.